and turn over the hosting to you. Awesome. You're in charge. Cool. All right. Let me see how smoothly I can screen share. I should know how to do this by now. I teach two classes on Zoom at this point. All right. Can y'all see this? Yeah, looks yes, good. We can. Awesome. I'm operating on one screen because I had knee surgery like a week ago, so I have to keep my leg propped up. So I'm uh, limited to one screen. Normally I'm on two, so I'm not going to be able to see everybody, but hopefully we're feeling good. Do we want to give folks like another minute or two to hop on or should we get started? I think it's okay to get started. We're recording too, so if people... Miss awesome the cool screen. all right well i'm gonna hide the video panel so that the screen's more visible awesome hey everybody thanks so much for joining me and hopping on this session uh about <coughs> technique that i uh have developed in my past 10 years of doing anti-sexual violence work that uh really came out of like a gap that i experienced as my own um kind of journey as a sexual violence survivor, activist, peer educator uh, that I'm hoping might be helpful to some folks. So we're going to talk about the ABC method of supporting victim survivors. First things first, um, y'all probably are used to this kind of stuff in these spaces, but we're talking about sexual violence. I'm not going to get really into details of stories or things like that, but we know everybody's triggers are really individual to them. And so please feel the utmost permission to do whatever you got to do to take care of yourself, including popping out of the space. There's no judgment here. So, like I said, this kind of tool really came out of uh, my own experiences in learning how to do this work. So uh, I myself, I'm a survivor of sexual violence. Um, my first experience of sexual assault happened when I was 16 years old. And I didn't realize that what happened to me was sexual assault until I got to college and someone told me about consent for the first time. And for the first time I heard someone say that like, just because you didn't say no, doesn't mean it's a yes. And like, for me, uh, throughout my time in college and beyond, I've done a lot of work teaching 18 to 22 year olds about consent. And I've seen so much how late that is for a lot of folks. But like I said, I've been doing this work since I was 18. Um, both in college and I'm now a college administrator. So I have a master's degree in higher education administration. I work at a college, I'm a confidential resource for survivors as well as the director of prevention. And so I get to supervise right now 48 peer educators, which is really awesome on a campus of only 1800 students. Um, and we do work to support survivors, to educate, to bring awareness. Um, and I've gotten to do a lot of really cool stuff through this. Like this is absolutely my life's work. Um, something like tremendously cool like I've gotten to speak with Tarana Burke a couple of years ago right after Me Too came about um, the, an event that I founded at my alma mater um, really became a seat of a lot of activism if any folks have seen the documentary The Hunting Ground uh, I didn't make it in but I did make it into like a little picture on the preview on Netflix which was really really cool and fun me with my dog at our march and victim blaming um, and so it's been really, really neat to stay in touch with young people, young adults who are doing this work and see kind of the evolution because uh, it's happening less and less that folks are hearing the word consent for the first time when they're 18 years old and at a college orientation. And that makes me really, really happy. Uh, but one of the things that I found when I was doing the sexual violence prevention activism was that uh, even though I was a peer educator for my school, even though I was doing this all the time, nobody really trained me on how to help survivors. We were all just like people trying to help other people stumbling around in the dark. Um, we didn't get good education on resources or how to be helpful, um, but we were getting folks all the time. Like I would post stuff about the work that I was doing on Facebook and I would get a Facebook message from like somebody on my siblings grades who was still in high school being like, Rachel, this thing happened to me. Like, can you help me? Um, and I was like, of course I can help you, but nobody had really trained me how to do that. And so this is sort of my gift uh, to everybody in order to hopefully further along that conversation and how we can be supportive to each other, whether or not you yourself are a survivor. So why this is important. I do a lot of work of training college students on my campus on how to support survivors, because what we know is the vast majority of the time, people don't go 
to a formal resource. The first time they talk to somebody, they're not talking to a hotline. They're not talking to a counselor. They're not um, talking to a confidential advocate. They're usually talking to a friend, a peer, maybe their team captain, maybe a sibling. Uh, and we know that that conversation, especially the first time they tell their story, is kind of make or break. Like the support they receive can really help define their healing journey. And if they have a really negative response, that can make things a lot worse. And then we still are seeing so many survivors who never tell anyone at all. And one of the things that we know is actually telling somebody your story is associated with better outcomes in terms of your healing. So it's really important that people feel like they do have outlets to tell their story. Um, a little note on language, you'll see I use victim survivor. I do that because language is complicated and folks should be able to use the language that they most want to use. And so um, acknowledging that all of these terms may not feel comfortable for everybody. I choose to use victim survivor with a hyphen to acknowledge it's like kind of a spectrum. Some people feel solely like one, some people solely feel like the other. Some days sometimes people might switch in between. So that's sort of my way of using an umbrella term to talk about this stuff. So one of the things we know um, is that it can be really, really hard to tell your story. And I use two different words to talk about telling your story. Disclosure, meaning informally telling somebody about it versus reporting, which is going to some sort of formal uh, resource person in order to uh, ask that something is done about what happened to you. So one of the ones that I see most often is folks who don't recognize what happened to them as sexual violence, right? Folks like me who don't know what the definition of consent is, um, who end up either blaming themselves or writing things off or saying, oh, that's, that's not bad enough. Like, I know what real sexual assault is, this isn't that. I can't tell you all the number of times folks have come into my office and said, Rachel, I'm really sorry if I'm wasting your time, um, but I just wanted to talk about this thing. And what they're talking about absolutely meets the definition of sexual assault. And they're sitting there apologizing for wasting my time. And I'm like, this is exactly what I'm here for. Um, so part of what we can do if we are supporting other people is really validate, right? Let them know that uh, your trauma doesn't have to be the worst trauma in the world for it to deserve help and healing and support. And also to just validate those experiences because uh, for so long, folks are really invested in telling us, oh, well, that's just a bad date or that's just a bad experience or, oh, you're such a prude. This is what you should expect all of these things and really normalizing a lot of trauma, which is really terrible. Uh, another big barrier is that folks don't think other folks will understand it or see it as bad enough. So again, as we are building this culture of being more supportive, that validation is super important. So folks know that other people will take it seriously when they tell their story. They don't know what resources are, are available. Super, super common. One of the best things somebody can do to be an ally or a support is become familiar with the resources that are available to them in your community, in your school, in your state, territory, country, wherever you may live. Um, folks might not trust the resources that are immediately available for a lot of different reasons, which is why it's so important that we have a diversity of different resources available. Um, ones that do the sort of peer-to-peer -peer support work ones that are identity focused. So survivors who are survivors of color, who are queer survivors, who um, are disabled survivors, like can have a resource that really fits them, their experience and their identity, if those things matter to them in their experience of sexual violence, which we know it very often does. Fear of being blamed or shamed, super, super high up there. Another really big one is that if you tell your story to somebody else, it sort of makes it real in a really intense way, uh, right? Like me telling my story means like, I can't just pretend this is all in my head. And so uh, I've done a lot of surveys on college campuses and one of the top three reasons every single time that college students say they haven't gotten help yet is they say they don't feel like they can deal with it right now. So if they don't tell anyone, they don't have to deal with it. Um, and that really sucks. Um, to keep people from getting the help they need because um, they don't feel supported or they don't know what to do. And so they'd rather just brush it under the rug than get help. Um, folks are constantly afraid of the fallout or the repercussions, whether those are social ones, like um, everybody in school is gonna know, or you know maybe this person will retaliate against me if I tell my story and I name who did it to me, 
Um, they're afraid of being seen differently by family and friends. That's a big one I hear is that folks uh, don't want to tell their parents because it would absolutely kill their parents and they would rather protect them, their parents, by just not telling them, even if that means not getting the help that they need. Um, right. And then there's a lot of fear about legal repercussions. Um, will I have to go through the criminal justice system even if I don't want to? What does it mean to make a report? And so it's really important to keep in mind all of these things that might be going through somebody's head when they are telling you their story. So before we get into the ABCs, I like to do a really quick thing about the neurobiology of trauma and victim blaming because uh, one of the things that is really, really hard to understand is as humans, uh, we are sort of psychologically hardwired um, to not understand trauma until we've been through it because trauma is an absolute survival mechanism. And so uh, it is an experience of fear, threat, lack of safety that triggers a lot of things in your body and brain that uh, we don't normally access. And so it can be really hard from the outside looking in, understanding somebody's experience and that lack of understanding can lead to victim blaming. So if we're thinking about supporting other people, um, having the answers to some of these questions that may arise for you can be really helpful so that you're not putting that on that person. So uh, a big one that I hear is that, you know, like some things are worse than others that, um, oh, you know, well, you weren't really sexually assaulted or at least you weren't raped or whatever it might be. And one of the things we know, A, everybody experiences trauma differently. The meaning that you make out of the situation um, the way that you process your healing is a really complex network of both what happened, um, your prior experiences of trauma, your prior support, your prior mental health, and how folks step up and support you. And so two people can go through the same exact series of events, but come out very different on the other side because of a lot of different things. It's a very personal experience. Um, but we also know from studies that there is no hierarchy of sexual violence trauma. Like it's not like rape is always, always worse than this or that. It is really about the meaning made of the situation. And so there's been found over and over again that there's absolutely no correlation between the amount of physical violence and the victim survivor's negative psychological symptoms. And folks have not yet discovered exactly what causes that because that's kind of hard in psychology research but they think that um because um physical violence is associated generally with stranger assaults and that more often when folks are assaulted by someone they know there's instead like coercion or incapacitation that the the violation somebody experiences when someone they know hurts them uh is often worse because like you trusted that person. And so that, that violation and that betrayal can, can be worse to deal with on a lot of ways. So um, there's no hierarchy of trauma. We are not playing trauma Olympics. We are not saying my experience was worse than yours. Um, nobody is more or lesser of a survivor based on what has happened to them. And that's really, really important to reiterate. Cause like I said, so often folks come forward thinking that, oh, well, what happened to me wasn't really bad enough. Like I know people who have had worse experiences, they are all bad. And there's no kind of threshold at which like you must have this much trauma to seek help. That's not true. Another thing that folks deal with a lot is um, they don't come forward because they can't remember exactly what happened to them. And this is really, really common because like I said, um, when you experience trauma, you go into survival mode. And so what happens is your brain releases a whole bunch of hormones that are uh, helping to protect you, helping to get you through. What we also know is that um, those uh, hormones directly affect the parts of the brain called the amygdala. Uh, that store memories. So because human beings, we were evolved to survive, not to be perfect little witnesses to our own trauma. So it's highly unlikely actually that somebody remembers absolutely everything that happened to them because uh, their brain's not wanting to them to remember. And so it's really uncommon for somebody to be able to say, well, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Um, instead, folks may 
store things like sensory or emotional memories, like a feeling of fear, a smell, a sight, um, in sort of a, a random or out of order way. Uh, there's a really famous uh, psychologist, um, Jim Hopper, who is at Harvard Medical School, who's one of the folks who trained me in this stuff. And he says that it's like if you wrote a 10 page paper on post-it notes and the wind blew a whole bunch of them away. The post-it notes that you have there are still accurate. They're still part of the paper, but they might not make sense because they're totally out of order and out of context. And that's what a lot of survivors might experience that can um, lead to them being hung up when they're trying to tell their story or go through the criminal justice process because they don't have the full picture. Um, and those, those really strong memories can also become really strong triggers to folks. Um, in ways that they may not really understand. We talk a lot about trigger warnings, content warnings in terms of like providing folks a heads up that we're gonna talk about sexual violence. But for some folks, a trigger might be a leather jacket or the smell of cigarette smoke or right uh, a certain candle that was burning or a perfume that they were wearing that night, uh, the clothes that they were wearing, anything like that, a TV show that was on when it happened. So this can be really, really hard for someone to understand if they've never been through it before. Um, and somebody might say, well, if you can't remember everything that happened to you, well, you must be lying. That's absolutely, absolutely not true. And so it's really important when we're supporting other folks, um, we're not gonna act as investigators. We're not gonna pry for all the details. We're not gonna try to pull it out of them. Um, we're gonna validate whatever they share with us um, and let them know that it's, it's totally normal to not remember everything that happened to you because your brain doesn't want you to. Lastly, um, so many folks um, I talk to, especially when I talk to prevention, are like, I don't understand because if somebody tried to assault me, I would just fight them off. Like, my parents raised me to be a really strong person. I would just do that. Uh, the problem is that the fight, flight, or freeze, which we are still not even talking about the freeze part enough, that's an instinct. You don't get to choose. Um, it is a survival mechanism activated in your body. And so what we know is that over 50% of victim survivors report some manner of freezing in response to their assault. It might be the sort of reflective stop, kind of like deer in the headlights, your pupils dilate, you're trying to figure out what to do next, your body is taking information. Or it might be a more extended type of freeze that is meant to protect you to get through. Because something that we know is that uh, the fight reflex, there's no fight reflex that is going to cause a squirrel to fight a tiger. You're only going to fight if you can get away or win. Otherwise, that fight reflex doesn't help you survive because that just might bring more violence towards you. Um, and oftentimes, the flight's not going to get activated if there's no good way to get out of the situation. And so instead, folks may freeze to protect themselves. That freezing might look like dissociation, which is sort of a feeling of being removed from your body, like that you're numb, that you're spaced out. Dissociation is a really uh, spectrum of things all the way from like daydreaming to complete out of body experiences. If y'all are old enough to drive and you've been on a long car ride and you're driving and suddenly you don't remember the past 10 miles that you've drived, that's a form of dissociation, one of the kind of lower feelings. But there's also something that happens to a lot of folks called tonic immobility, um, which is a survival reflex. And it's a complete inability to move. And so that's protect somebody from worse retaliation to get them through the situation. Uh, one of the things we know is that tonic immobility actually happens way more often than we previously thought it did. There was a study that came out of, I think, Sweden, some Scandinavian country that said it could happen up to 60% of the time. And another study showed that experiencing tonic immobility is correlated with super high rates of self-blame. Because if you can't understand why you didn't fight back, why you didn't say something, why you didn't run away, why you didn't get help, you start to think, well, maybe I just wanted it to happen or maybe I deserved it. And that's absolutely not the case. Uh, you don't get to control which one of these reflexes your body chooses. And so a lot of the work that I do with survivors is just normalizing that and saying like, no, that's absolutely a super common thing to feel like, to look back on your situation and think, I don't know why I didn't do anything else. You didn't do anything else because your body and your brain was trying to protect you. So that is a tiny little smattering of um, info about some of the experiences of trauma. Now we're gonna get to the ABC method. So like I said, the ABC method came out of my experience 
experiences because so many times folks came to me once I became a professional resource and said, Rachel, how do I support folks? Um, and they really wanted some sort of like script or guide. And I have to preface this by saying there is no absolute script. There is no perfect guide on how to do this. When somebody comes to you to tell their story, that's a really human conversation. But the most important thing to remember is that they are telling you because they trust you and because they have some sort of relationship with you. So lean on that relationship and how you've interacted with them before. Um, it is less about saying all the perfect things and more about just expressing your support in general. But if you need a handy dandy little way to remember some of the stuff that you should do, we have ABCs. So the first thing that I preface all of this is, is when you become a professional advocate, uh, one of the first things they teach you is this bus metaphor. Because sexual violence and intimate partner violence, all of these different acts are about power and control. Power and control has been taken away from the victim survivor. The most important thing for their healing is to give that power and control back. Um, and one of the ways we think about this is putting them in the driver's seat. So if you are supporting somebody who's experienced sexual violence, um, you can kind of like be their GPS, like you can point out landmarks along the way, you can look up the map or the directions, but they absolutely need to have their hands on the wheel and their feet on the brakes and the gas and they have to have autonomy over where they're going. That is so, so important. Um, this support should not be about forcing them to do things that they don't want to do. It should not be about uh, taking away options. They always say to us, focus on giving options rather than advice. And so that is really, really important as you go through all of this. So the A in the ABCs is acknowledge. Um, this really ties into uh, active listening, if you've ever heard of that, really, really well. So what you want to do with acknowledge is, um, I'm going to go actually back, right? Like, make sure that person feels heard, that you are there with them, whether this is happening in person or over Zoom. So acknowledge uh, will be like showing that you're understanding the severity of what happened. It also means mirroring the language that they used to describe what happened to them. More often than not, folks don't come to me and say, Rachel, I was sexually assaulted. They say, Rachel, so this thing happened and I'm not really sure how to think about it. And I'm, I say, okay, tell me about the thing, what happened? Um, it also means like language that they use about themselves, their identity, their pronouns, um, what they call the person who did this to them. Uh, really important to use that, use the language that they use so that they feel really, really validated. Um, so acknowledging the first step might sound like something like, thank you for trusting me with your story. That sounds really awful. Or I know that was really hard to talk about. Thank you so much for telling me. Or I'm so glad that you've decided to get help. Like acknowledging any positive steps that they've already taken. Like, wow, I can't believe you've already uh, told your therapist. That's a super great step. I'm so proud of you. So, right, like the positive feedback that I'm here with you, um, I'm listening, I'm understanding. Acknowledging means really hearing what's behind it, too. Um, I can tell you a time I was really not good at supporting survivors was really early on in my journey when I had a friend um, and I knew her and I knew that she was very religious and I knew that she was uh, saving herself for marriage. And this was something that was really, really important to her. Um, and she came over to my room one night when I was in college and she said, well, me and so-and-so had sex. Um, and I should have in that moment known that that wasn't something that she ever wanted to do and been super concerned and been like, are you okay? What happened? But I didn't really know how to do this yet. And so I was like, oh my God, congrats. And then I looked at her face and I was like, oh my God, she didn't want this to happen. And so, right, like try to use this active listening to hear what they're saying um, and show that you're there for them. That like can be demonstrated with so much than just more than words. It can be your body language. Um, it can be like the eye contact that you use the kind of little affirmations of head nods or mm -hmm, so that you're staying with them as they're telling the story. The next one is believe. This is super, super important, right? Because folks go through so much self-blame and there is still so much victim blaming that happens in our society, so much shaming. Um, 
the person, when they are telling their story, it is so important that they are reminded over and over again that they are believed and they are supported. So this might sound like um, letting them know, right, that they're not to blame for what happened, right? Like, you didn't choose this. You didn't cause this. This was a choice somebody else made to hurt you. And right, like, I'm here for you. I love you. Like, whatever it is that you want to say to let them know that you are here. So it might sound like it wasn't your fault. It might sound like you're not alone. I'm here for you. I love you. I believe you. Um, I say a lot to folks. I was like, this might sound obvious. And I know that you know this, but I'm going to say it out loud again. This was not your fault. Never underestimate the power of hearing that because so often, right, our logical brain is telling us, I know, I know I couldn't have changed it. I know that this wasn't my fault, but there's a deep kind of voice inside the back of your head or sitting in your chest going, but what, but what if, but what if, but what if? And so if we as friends and supporters can squash down that voice as much as possible for them, that's really, really important and can be so valuable. Believing is not asking a whole bunch of questions or playing investigator, like I mentioned earlier. A lot of folks, um, we are naturally like caretakers. I'm one of these people, like we wanna fix it. We wanna fix the situation. We wanna jump into action in some way. So maybe it's like, you're really trying to understand absolutely everything happened. So you say something like, why did you do this? Or why didn't you do that? Um, Right? That stuff can be really harmful because that can hit those nerves of self-blame that have already been activated. Um, or right, like trying to convince somebody it wasn't that bad, or you know, are you sure it really happened? Maybe it was a misunderstanding. Um, all of that stuff, not helpful in this situation. Right. The other thing that's really important to remember and recognize is that most often folks experience sexual violence at the hands of somebody that they know and trust, whether that's um, a partner. Um, a spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, um, whether that's a best friend, whether it's a teacher, whether it's, you know, just somebody you know in your classes, in your grade. Um, and we often want to think that everybody we know in our lives are good people and that they would never do that. And that perpetrators are some creepy person in a black coat, you know, hanging out in a dark alley after midnight. Um, and that like everybody should be able to know, like you should be able to have this gut instinct that this is a bad person. That's not always the case. Um, I've been sexually assaulted two times in my life. The first was by my very first boyfriend. Um, the second time was by my best friend and that one happened in my college dorm room. And so again, understanding that uh, you can be really hurting somebody if you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. It was so-and-so, so-and-so did that. Um, understanding that, you know, anybody can be capable of sexual violence, that the only thing that defines that is them not getting consent is really, really hard to reckon with, but also really important in terms of being a support. Because so often, um, this involves friend groups or, you know, peer groups, classes, things like that. And so a big reason why a survivor might not come forward is because they don't want their friends to have to choose sides because um, they're not sure. And so letting somebody know like, hey, no, I'm on your side. I'm going to support you is really, really an important part of that believing process. Last step in the ABCs, check-in. The check-in ties really closely with that bus driving metaphor. You are checking in to figure out what they need in order to heal as best as possible. Um, so checking in is asking or offering ways that you can help or support them, offer resources, but you're not telling them what to do. So it might be like, do you want me to Google hotlines, resources, or like, hey, I know this person. I tell folks all the time, like, sometimes it can be so helpful for you to say, hey, I know Rachel. Do you want me to walk with you to her office? Or do you want me to dial the phone so you can talk to her, right? Sometimes when somebody's super overwhelmed, that simple act of offering to dial a phone, super, super important and beneficial. Um, Maybe, right, like something like, it sounds like you're thinking about reporting. Would it be helpful if I went with you? Like offering your support, not saying um, you have to, but like if this is something that matters to you, I'll go with you. Um, and then the last part is checking in about how they want ongoing support. 
there might be some folks who are like, hey, I just wanted to tell you right now because I'm having a really bad night. I'm having awful flashbacks. Like, can we just sit on your couch and like watch cute puppy videos? Um, and then like, I don't ever want to talk about it again. So respecting their boundaries or maybe saying something like, hey, is it okay if I check in on you next week just to see how you're doing? And, you know, like next week, sending them a text like, hey, friend, just wanted you to know I'm thinking about you. Let me know if there's anything that I can do. Um, because they may not want you to bring it up to them, especially without warning, so that because they want control over how they're experiencing this and they're experiencing healing. Um, they So finding out what that's going to look like to them is going to be super, super important to be able to support them in the best way possible. This is my cat, Honeybee. She's going to be a brat. So checking in does not look like telling somebody what they have to do. I see this a lot when folks are like super, super justice minded or are really, really close to a victim survivor. Um, like, like you absolutely have to go to the police. Like this person can't be allowed to go get away with this. You don't want to take that power and control out of their hands. Um, you don't want to make them feel bad if you know, reporting is not something they're capable of doing right now because that is a huge ordeal. Um, another really important part of the checking in is you shouldn't go around and tell their story to a bunch of people that they haven't expressed it's okay to tell, especially the person who has hurt them. If this is any type of intimate partner violence, if this is relationship violence, confronting the perpetrator can put them in more danger. And that's absolutely not something that you want to do. Uh, so even if you're like, oh my God, I can't believe this person did that. Like I have to go find them. I, like they have to know that they did something wrong. You need to kind of get a handle on those feelings and center the victim survivor in this situation. Um, right. And you want to avoid making the situation about your feelings so that they have to comfort you. Right. Like, um, it's really important that you are also getting supports so that you can be the best friend that you can be in this situation. Um, you want to be there for them. So it's really important that if somebody comes to you with their story, you have supports. Um, and it's super, super normal uh, to need support when you're in that situation, especially if it's an ongoing one. Like you've got a friend who's in an unhealthy relationship, but they're not ready to leave. Uh, and maybe you're the person you feel most comfortable going to for support is like another friend in your friend group or an older sibling or something. But it's really important that if your friend is not ready to tell their story, that you keep that information with you and confide in a professional resource instead um, so that the story isn't going beyond that person's control. So totally cool and normal to need support. Find somebody who works with, who like you can work with, who can help you and give you advice and support because um, when you are helping being a friend being a supportive friend you are not doing the same job as being a professional resource and that is really really important you are allowed to set boundaries you're allowed to take care of yourself um, you're allowed to tell that person wow this feels above my pay grade I think we should go talk to somebody else or you know uh, I really want to support you, but this is the limit on how much I can support you in that moment, especially if you are a survivor yourself. Yourself. So if you don't know where to go for resources, there's a lot of ways to get connected with either national resources or um, local ones. And so there's a lot of different ways to do that. There's the National Sexual Violence Hotline that's run by RAIN. Uh, they have a 24 seven, uh, phone line and they have a 24 seven online confidential chat. I point this out because I know folks of my generation and beyond uh, don't really like talking on the phone and or in the COVID reality, right? Folks may not have the privacy to talk on the phone out loud, right? Because roommates or parents or folks may overhear. So being able to instant message somebody can be super, super key. Um, when it comes to relationship violence, there's also loveisrespect.org, which has uh, an online both phone and typing text hotline. Um, all of these organizations can get you linked up to resources closer to your community. The RAIN hotline phone line will actually forward you to the closest uh, one to you.
But metoomovement.org also has a ton of resources and you can search by different categories. So if you have a friend who's really struggling with their sexual orientation in relationship to the uh, violence that they experienced, you can look for resources for LGBTQ folks. You can look for resources for specifically Asian Americans, for Black Americans, um, anything like that. Uh, there's a lot of different search tools on these on Me Too's website that you can use to kind of shift through some of the resources that are available. So ABCs, acknowledge, believe, check in, right? For me, that might sound like saying like, thank you so much for telling me your story. I'm really glad that you trusted me. Uh, I just wanted to let you know I'm here for you. How else can I help you? Is it helpful if I, um, you know, dial the phone. If you want to go talk to another resource, can I get you connected to a counselor who can talk to you more? ABC, super simple. And right, put your own personal spin on it. This is based on your relationship with the person. Um, and if you don't want to take it from me, this is DJ Zeke Thomas, who is also a survivor. Um, this is a really short video from him about what you can do to support survivors and he doesn't use the ABCs but he says a lot of similar things so if you want to listen to the way that he frames it this can be really really cool you know a survivor of sexual violence you might be the first person someone tells immediately after being sexually assaulted or a survivor might wait weeks months or even years to say what happened both are common, normal reactions. If someone you know tells you their story, here are some examples of things you can say. Thank you for telling me. It was not your fault. You did nothing wrong. I am here for you. You are brave. You are never alone. How can I help? You are a survivor. Everyone heals in their own time and in their own way. The path isn't always a straight line, and you don't need to go it alone. You can read or share messages here. You can join an online survivor group and connect with your local rape care center for resources. My name is Zeke Thomas, and I am a survivor. You're muted. Thank you for whoever told me that. My cat is on the space bar. Um, so yeah, Zeke said a lot of those same things, right? Like, I'm here for you. I believe you. Like, you are strong, right? So thinking about those positive messages that you can give to that person. Um, and sometimes it's sitting in silence. Sometimes it's like, I don't necessarily know what to do or what to say, but hey, I'm here for you. I love you. Like, let's figure it out together. Uh, all of that is really the most important parts of this conversation. So the last piece that I like to mention, because I think this gets left out or kind of like really watered down uh, in the conversations that we have, is talking about vicarious trauma and self-care. So like I said, it is absolutely a great thing if you are in a position of supporting somebody for you to reach out to resources to make sure to take care of you because that makes you the best friend possible because that takes care of you and your needs um, and it makes everything better all around. But something that's really, really important for me to mention is a term called vic vicarious trauma. I hadn't heard about this until uh, maybe like a year into my professional career and I went to a conference with people about me and uh, this presenter started talking about vicarious trauma. And one of the things that she said is the top three risk factors for vicarious trauma are one, being young in age. Wow, wish I knew that one uh, when I was a super young person doing this work. Uh, number two is physical, social or geographic isolation. Uh, I'm from the middle of nowhere, and especially I work with a lot of college students who are moving away to go to college for the first time. They don't have their same uh, support systems. They're away from their parents for the first time. They uh, just don't have 
maybe even pets who are supportive or annoying, depending on the situation. Um, so they feel really, really alone. And the last of the top three risk factors for vicarious trauma is not knowing that it exists. Um, because if you don't know that this can happen to you, you just think that you're weak or you're a bad friend, or you don't even realize that this is stemming from something that you're experiencing. So vicarious trauma is kind of an umbrella term that folks use to talk about a lot of different uh, experiences, things like compassion fatigue. So like just getting burnt out of helping people um, or being exposed to trauma through hearing somebody's stories, through seeing stuff that has happened to people. Um, it can be counter-transference where you really internalize somebody else's battles to the point where like it's keeping you up at night that you haven't fixed this yet. I see that one a lot with young activists who can get absolutely overwhelmed with just how much there is still to do and like I don't understand why everybody else isn't angry. I don't understand why everybody else isn't doing the absolute most to stop this um, and then just sort of burn out the like long-term exhaustion from just uh, not feeling like you have the power to stop this from not having a structure of support. All of this stuff can fall under vicarious trauma. Uh, what that manifests in is stuff like having trouble talking about your feelings, being really, really tired, not being able to sleep, uh, difficulties with your memory or like making errors in your work that you wouldn't normally do. Um, I can tell when I'm getting really, really burnt out that, um, my memory is normally really, really great. And I suddenly have to write things down or I cannot remember them. Maybe it's just sort of these intrusive thoughts. Like you can't stop thinking about this one thing over and over and over again. Um, maybe it's just sort of general like pessimism of like just everything is hopeless. This is so much bigger than me. We are never going to solve this issue. Um, and so a lot of this stuff folks might be like, well, I'm just like a student. Things are really busy. I'm really tired. Everybody's tired. Um, but if you can understand that if you're being a support to somebody that you might need a little bit of support yourself, you can be proactive in making sure that this doesn't happen to you. Um, and that's super important too. Like you deserve help and support as you are supporting people as well. So if you ever start feeling like any of these things, absolutely reach out to somebody who can be a resource to you, whether that's a counselor, whether that's, you know, a clergy, a person of faith in your community, whether that's, you know, somebody who is an advocate or a supervisor, like make sure you have support so you can help other people the best you can too. And part of this is self-care. Self-care is a huge buzzword right now and definitely has been co-opted by a lot of like skincare companies and, you know, like makeup companies. Self-care absolutely can be skincare, uh, but it is so much more than that. Self-care is about building a meaningful life for yourself every single day. Um, and it can look different for different people. And so I really like the self-care wheel because it shows sort of all of the different aspects that folks can look into in terms of making sure they feel self like cared for. So for somebody, there's this whole axis of spiritual and like, I'm not spiritual, I am not religious, but um, going into nature can be that sort of spiritual self-care for somebody. Meditation can be, yoga can be, it can be prayer um, or finding a spiritual mentor. It can be volunteering for a cause. Um, there's personal self-care in terms of doing stuff that needs to get done, right? Sometimes self-care is cleaning the dirty clothes up off your floor because they've been there too long and you know it's going to stress you out even more. Um, sometimes it's, you know, taking care of some of your physical needs, right? Giving yourself permission to sleep or to eat well, um, going for a walk, exercising, um, anything like that. It's Self-care can absolutely be going to therapy, or, you know, reading a self-help book or doing a hobby that makes you feel really good. Um, it can be validating yourself. It can be self-love and self-compassion, all of those things. So it's absolutely not just bubble baths. It's absolutely not just the facial sheet mask. Um, it can be those things that can be part of it, but it should be so much more than that. And self-care is not for when things hit rock bottom. Self-care is for all the time. And so it really is about making sure that you are taking care of yourself all the time and building the kind of life you wanna live as much as possible in your circumstances. Um, so if you need an extra little reminder to ask yourself some of these questions, 
Um, if you need an extra kind of push to do one good thing for you today, here it is. This is a little self-care cat that says it's a good day to take care of yourself today. So it's every other day. This is so, so important. So that's it. That's kind of the show. Um, questions, comments, concerns, feel free to DM chat me if you don't want your name out there or unmute. Um, I know we've got folks in here who are monitoring. A great presentation. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. I felt like it was just so much really, I really like the concept of ABC. It makes it very simpler, simpler, simple to um, talk about fatigue, to be able to assist someone you care about in need and assist yourself. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, right. When you're in that scary, like the, oh my God, this person just told me, like, I've seen longer acronyms that like, I'm like, okay, wait, uh, uh, share, safety, help. And I'm like, I can't remember them. So I was like, ABC, I could do that one. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? We want to encourage people to go ahead and ask questions. And feel free. And you know, we have about five minutes left in this session. And Rachel, this has been amazing. I actually do want to say one more thing. I really liked the video that you put in there uh, with Z. Zeke. Yeah, that really brought it home in full circle because I think oftentimes when we think about sexual assault, we tend to assume that this is something that only happens to women. And so I just wanted to call that out and kind of just give you a gold star thumbs up on that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And that's a big part of being a supportive friend too, right? Because if you have a friend who's a guy who comes to you and says like, hey, I was sexually assaulted and you're still in that uh, experience of like, I'm only thinking sexual assault happens to women and girls. And you're like, no, you didn't, right? Like that's really crappy too. So part of this is widening your lens um, and thinking about that. So I really like, Zeke has done some incredible work around masculinity um, about specifically for him, gay men who are survivors and supporting each other. Um, and so, and he's just a really cool person. So he has a couple of videos online and stuff and he'll pop up at different events and he's awesome. So def recommend anything he's involved with. Last thing I will say is even if you don't feel comfortable here, here's a lot of different ways to get in contact with me. If there's anything I can ever do, uh, I have provided Safe Bay with a little handout on the ABCs and these slides in case you find them useful to you. Uh, feel free to use them all over. I just ask that you like give props to me. Um, if you want to follow my work Instagram account, I'm doing this more as myself, but uh, see the really awesome work that my college students are doing, you can follow at Candles Against Violence. And the final thing is I have spent all most of 2020 putting together this very thing right here, bit.ly slash sexual violence resource doc. Um, it is every resource that I know of in terms of education, healing, support, um, all in one Google doc. And so if you are looking for TED Talks on sexual violence, if you are looking for workshops on consent, if you are looking for activism toolkits, uh, I've put everything I know on there. Feel free to use it, spread it widely, or add me on LinkedIn or email me. Let me know how I can help you. I do talks with communities, with schools, with all sorts of folks. So um, if there's anything that I could do for you, absolutely, please feel free to hit me up. And if not, I will end the slide share. In case, but I'll give it 30 seconds in case folks are trying to get anything down. Well, thanks so much for having me here with y'all and for all of you who are making time on your Sunday to, you know, be here with everybody and learn. I hope you're having a great conference experience and thanks so much Safe Bay for hosting all of this. I just wanted to say thank you. All right, thanks, everybody. Um, just seeing faces and all that. I don't want to be sad, but just thank you. I wanted to make sure I made the connection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, more. everybody. Oh, I see I can't hear. I'm going to be using your phone. Oh, God. All right. Thank you. <laughs>
All right. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Bye.